I got to start the sermon off with one of the greatest lessons I ever learned when speaking to people. My mother, who was a longtime educator and administrator, told me, son, always remember the three B's. She said, be good, be brief, and be gone. <laughs> so I promise not to take too much of your time this morning. That being said, I would like to thank Pastor Joy Smith and Jerry for allowing me to be a part of today's worship service. It's, it's a humbling honor. Being brief wasn't the only lesson my mother taught me. Every day of her life, she found a way to deliver life lessons to me in hopes of molding me into become a good man. One of her favorite lines was, boy, if you are half the man that I am woman, you will grow up to be somebody one day. Every time she said that, I would look at her and she was so arrogant, I couldn't believe it. I was just like, is this woman serious? But when I look back on it now, I, I see a confidence, a special amount of confidence that she possessed. And that confidence was needed to lead her flock. Dr. King also possessed an extraordinary amount of confidence. His profound words resonated through the hearts and minds of millions of Americans during the Civil Rights era. And if for a moment he openly seemed weak or fragile, that movement that he led likely would have collapsed. This confidence shone brightest when he spoke to the multitude. This man was brilliant. I had to sit with a dictionary and a thesaurus a few times listening to him speak back in the day. Thank God for the pause button, because if I didn't have it, I would have been lost quite a few times during his sermons. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, one could agree that Dr. King was a Renaissance man, but I feel that his most extraordinary gift was his ability to educate and lead the masses. When I think about great teachers and preachers from the Bible, one of the first names that comes to mind is Peter. And I reflect back to one of my favorite spirituals where I first learned of Peter's oratorical prowess. There is a fall in Gilead that makes the wounded whole. There is a Assured of this, God 
God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Moving back to verse 29, something stuck out to me. Verse 29 says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. Now, Peter was illuminating that King David, who was a prophet and a man after God's own heart, was just a mortal. Now, moving forward to verse 36, Peter said with authority, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard these words, people didn't automatically believe the good news now that Peter and the disciples were spreading around. But that didn't stop them from sharing the gospel. As we all know, Dr. King encountered similar resistance as he spread his message of hope, peace, and equality. He taught these concepts even though his family was threatened. He was beaten, and ultimately, his life was taken. Those lessons were so important that he refused to stop delivering them. Those messages uplifted and stirred the souls of black people all across this country. When I reflect on why I think King resonated with so many people, I feel that there was something magnetic about the confidence and the authority in his delivery. His delivery ignited fervor in a group of people that had been systematically oppressed for centuries. Those people found comfort in King's confidence. Like Peter, King understood how difficult of a task he and his flock faced. The task of achieving equality seemed impossible at times, and I'm certain that King's confidence was shattered at some point during the struggle. Not long after the 1963 church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama, where four young black girls were found dead, buried under rubble, King was planning his next move, which happened to be in Selma, Alabama. It's rumored that King was so shaken by the senseless violence taking place across the South that he began second-guessing himself in pride. In the 2014 hit movie Selma, there's a scene where King is in the kitchen having a conversation with his wife, Coretta. During that conversation, Coretta gets a little irritated by King's callous joke of dying in action. She was afraid and had every right to be. Before his big trip to Selma the next day, you could see the fear in King's eyes. Dr. King pauses. He took out a piece of paper from his wallet he placed a phone call. In the scene, they show a woman asleep in a bed next to her husband, turning on the light, answering that phone call. Dr. King greets the woman and says, Hallie, I need to hear the Lord's voice. That voice spoke through the golden pipes of Sister Mahalia Jackson, one of the greatest gospel singers of all time. Mahalia obliged Dr. King and sang, Take my hand, precious Lord. The scene transitions into King and his flock arriving in Selma the next day to begin their newest journey. The rest was history. Now, even if this scene didn't actually happen, it's rumored to have happened, but even if it didn't happen, King would almost always have a song 
lead before his sermons and speeches. Those songs gave him strength. Those songs ignited him. And I'm willing to bet that he had one of those powerful songs before he said what I find to be one of the most profound things he ever said. He said this. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. We heard those lines earlier in prayer during this worship service. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Did you ever stop to think that you can't leave your job in the morning without being dependent on most of the world? You get up in the morning and go to the bathroom and reach over for a sponge, and that's handed to you by a Pacific Islander. You reach for that bar of soap, and that's given to you by a Frenchman. Then you go into the kitchen to drink your coffee in the morning, and that's poured in your cup by a South American. Maybe you want some tea in the morning, and that's poured in your cup by a Chinese. Or maybe you're just serious of having cocoa for breakfast, and that's poured in your cup by a West African. And then you reach over for your toast, and that's given to you by the hands of an English-speaking farmer, not to mention the baker. And before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, You've depended on more than half of the world. This is the way our universe is structured. This is its interrelated quality. We aren't going to have peace on Earth until we recognize the basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. Those are King's words. Now, when you meet resistance like Peter, when you suffer hardships like King, I challenge us all to close our eyes, <clears throat> reach out our hands, and sing these words. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. The common denominator between Peter and Martin Luther King Jr is their steadfast love of the greatest teacher of all. That teacher is Jesus Christ. Jesus teaches us to have faith in him. He will carry us through that storm. He will carry us through the night. He will help us find the peace that Dr. King <coughs> so eloquently spoke about. He will lead us on. 